reading now the second to last homework assignment. Uh, chapter 7, uh, 35, 41, 43, 44, for a grad problem. It's a short assignment. to make it do Tuesday after the break, but we could vote on that now if you want to just make, I'm going to have two more assignments you to do on Tuesdays or Thursdays. You want to make them later or earlier? But make it on the last one on the Thursday, everyone here will get it back in time. <coughs> so I might compromise, it's a little bit short, just make it down to Thursday. That makes it a vote. Certainly, before Thanksgiving, we should have covered everything except perhaps stratified random sampling, which is the last section, 7.5 in the chapter 7. It's kind of a review section, I mean, review chapter, but it doesn't feel like a review chapter. <laughs> you I've never done this. Okay. So, to the sixth. All right. Simple random sampling. Yeah, simple random sampling is cool. So, well, the central limit theory is, is very analogous to what we did in chapter 5. All you have, you simply have a finite population correction term to adjust the formula for the variance, that's all. So other than that, it's all the same, but there's a lot more work, you know, applied type work. So what, are you, what is uh, p hat? You might as well just jump in there and talk about p hat. Well, maybe before we talk about the essential limit there, what is p hat? I think at the end of note 17. Um, I talk about a dichotomous variable. So, what is p hat? They're going to come with these p hats. Look at the example of the hospital data, which is section 7.2. Let's just go ahead and look at where your own problems. Hospital data, example 72. Well, right. hats are usually approximations, aren't they? The hats, yeah. They're estimated, is what they are. Hat denotes estimated. Yeah. Hat denotes estimate or estimator. What's the difference between an estimate and an estimator. That's sometimes um, useful if, if you're being very careful with your language. Estimator is a random variable. Okay, estimate is the observed value of the random variable. Okay. So this p hat can stand for either one. Does the word functional mean anything uh, as, as a noun in that context, a functional? Uh, it means it's real value or complex value. Okay, it's one-dimensional value, a functional. Okay, because I'm thinking back to Kalman filtering and, and you're, you're always using you know, hats as estimators and just trying to put them together. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is a little bit different. Okay. This is a little bit different um, culture. So they're talking about functional culture. Okay. All right. What about the hospital data? There you have 393 hospitals. And and you have a certain, and you have only, and all you have is, well, let's see, I guess you have, um, a couple, you have some different information. You have, actually, if you look at it, you've got uh, XI, which is the number of discharges in the month of January 1968 in the hospital. Okay, in a certain time period, so it was January 1968, this is a cold 
all those data, okay? Uh, and then there was another variable too. Because each marble doesn't have to have just one number on it. It can have a pair of numbers on it, right? So we're going to get into pairs of, random, of, of numbers here pretty soon. And what was the Y? Um, let's see. We have that in section 7.4, I believe. Um, Ah, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, let's call this Y. Well, they call it, they changed the name later. Okay? Let's call this YI. Okay? Even though in the beginning of section 72, they call it something else. They call it XI. Because we're only talking about one variable. Now I'm going to, because I'm going to add a second variable, I'm going to call XI is the number of beds in the I hospital. So that's actually what's known. And then we're going to come up with a dichotomous variable, di equals 1. You can all, out of these variables, you can always construct other variables. Uh, for example, if yi is less than or equal to 1,000, then di is 1. If yi is bigger than 1,000, then di is 0. That's a dichotomous variable. So your YI is a uh, mu or something? No, YI is just, you have a hospital. It's got two numbers. All right? One or the X and the Y. How many beds do I have? Uh, 700 beds. Okay. How many discharges did I have in the month of January? 1968. <laughs> um, I had um, 1,500 discharges. Okay? In that month. Okay? So the number of discharges per bed was two, and plus a little bit, okay, in that situation. So I can talk about that. I just took YI over X, but that's something we're not actually going to do. But what I can talk about is the mean, then, then we don't, let's say we don't know how many, I mean, I'd have to do a, a lot of uh, work to go through all these 393 hospitals and figure out how many discharges everybody had, right? That's 400 hospitals or something like that, unless I'm trying to figure out how many discharges from, you know, maybe these are all the hospitals in a certain county or city or state or whatever. And I'm trying to figure out how many people actually went through those hospitals. Okay. Do I actually go and pull down all the records and have everybody add them up and everything and submit them to me? I go through 400 people. Cool. to do that, or, you know, I mean, nowadays maybe it's all on the computer, but in the, in the old days it wasn't. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> maybe this is not an up-to-date example, but still the same principles apply. Or do I somehow audit the records of these hospitals, figure out, for random sample of size, let's say 25, how many discharges those 25 hospitals and somehow estimates the total number of discharges of all the hospitals by knowing how many hospitals there were. <clears throat> how would you do that? So then you have the, the total, tau, is the total number of discharges, yi, i goes from 1 to 393. That's not a random quantity in our model. That's just the total number of discharges in January 1968. That's the population total. That's a parameter. So that's the total number of discharges. Yeah, it's just the total number of all of the whole population. It's a population number. Okay. 
And let's say I want to estimate that. Okay? That's equal to capital N mu sub y equals 393 mu sub y. That's the average number of discharges per hospital. Mu sub y equals average number of discharges per hospital. is, again, a population parameter equal to summation y i divided by capital N. I go from 1 to 393. That's, all, that's what we call the population mean. So it's not a random variable. So how could I estimate this mu y or this top? Mu y could be estimated by a sample mean, right? Right. Estimate mu y. So that's what you're going to do. And we know that the that the average value of y bar is mu sub y, but to all possible superannual samples, there's a bunch of them. How many are there? Uh, 393 choose 25. That's a huge number of simple random samples. Okay, so there's a huge number of possibilities for what the y bar values might be. But we have the idea by the essential limit theory that most of them are concentrated around sort of near mu y, and we actually know the spread of the distribution of y bar. We do have a central limit there. And sigma sub y bar is equal to uh, sigma y squared over n times 1 minus little n minus 1 over capital N minus 1, where this is a finite population correction. We don't have independent samples, so we have this the actual variability is a little bit smaller actually. Because if I the way the way I think about this, take a limited case, little n equals capital N, there's no variability at all. In this point. There's only one simple random sample size, so capital N. Alright? And so there's no variability at all in that point. You just get the population parameter, the population mean. Okay? In that case, the variability would be zero. Here, the variability is a little bit reduced. That's actually nice. Right? It's, it's theory. That's why you take a simple random sample. Okay? And you don't have to call people back again. <laughs> okay? So, um, I don't think that would be bad, but that's, that's the simple right example. Now, um, and so the CL, we have the uh, CLT is that Y bar is approximately, is roughly, is, is roughly distributed. As, so that we have the probability that Y bar minus mu sub y, it's like over uh, sigma sub y bar um, in absolute value, well, let's say between minus um, z uh, and plus z, let's say, is um, approximately equal to, but you would get uh, P of Z, capital P of Z minus capital P of minus Z equals 2 P of Z minus 1, using the identity that P of minus Z equals 1 minus P of Z, where P is the CDF of the standard model. Why well, approximately? Because uh, this, is a, this is a central limit there. Okay, this is the exact normal probability. Uh, this is not exactly N0, 1. 
There's two, two orders of approximation. Well, this is an approximation. From a such limit approximation. That's a such a limit theorem. The central limit theorem says it equals, right? No, because that's not exactly normal. Oh. It's just doing the curve. Okay. In fact, this is, this is a this discrete random variable. So then you can construct confidence numbers of use of y out of this. All right, let's just skip that for a moment, OK? Let's come back to the confidence numbers in a moment. So I'll just have to rewrite this equation. Because um, I was going to focus on what is p hat. So what is the p hat problem? So I think they mentioned that 65.4% of the hospitals had fewer than 1,000 discharges. Mm -hmm. What is that? That's a population parameter. Anything, any information about the whole population is a population parameter. Okay, that's what the little p is. So little p is another population parameter. See, I can talk about mu sub y, I can talk about mu sub x, I can talk about and so on. I can talk about, right? This is a population parameter. This is the little y here. Such good, uh, and and I used the little y for the variance. Where sigma sub y squared was summation y i squared divided by capital and i goes from one to three ninety three minus mu sub y squared. That's the shortcut formula for it. Sigma sub y squared. All right. That was a population parameter. What is the p? The p equals 0.654. They gave you in one of your homework problems for this week is uh, the summation di, i goes from 1 to 393. So they didn't introduce the di, okay? So I had to do it here, divided by the 393. It's just the fraction of all hospitals with fewer than 1,000 discharges. Precise whether whether they counted if you had exactly a thousand discharges, would you be in the group or not? Okay, I'm not going to worry about that. All right, a thousand has nothing to do with has nothing has not much to do with anything except maybe if you're a hospital administrator. Okay, and for our point of view, all right, we just that's just a population parameter. Let's say we're interested in. Okay. And how can I estimate it? That, that is a population mean. That, that is a population mean. It's a population mean of variable capital D. Because the number of discharges, right? Capital D takes only two values, so it's a dichotomous random variable, so called. Or an indicator variable. It takes two values, one and zero. So how would I do it? Enough. If y is less, if y i is less than a thousand, you count d equal to one and so on. So you can easily construct this variable d if you knew the variable y. If you knew all the little y i's. Actually, the fact of the matter is, is we're not going to know all the little y i's. Right? That's our statistical situation. We can talk about it as if we knew them all. Okay? But we don't actually know them all. So we don't actually know all the d's. Right? We don't know whether. Now, if I take a hospital at random, what, what if D is 1 or 0? So, you know, I investigate further. So I sample some of, you know, 25 hospitals, and I do investigate further, okay? And I find out what the actual little Ds are. And I actually, capital Ds we call them now. All right, so then I calculate uh, D bar equals summation D I. I goes from 1 to little n divided by little n. That's the sample mean of the Ds. Average, and that's what I call the p hat. That's, so I have two names for the sample fraction of hospitals with fewer than 1,000 discharges. This is a sample fraction of hospitals. Sample proportion, they also call it, of hospitals with less than 1,000 discharges. Again, the 
author does not put in this capital D part. He just wants to put in the cap. Okay. So what is the variance of D hat? Well, I could talk to you. It's, it's just this formula with little y replaced by D. But in that case, I can actually simplify because I can actually compute this more explicitly in terms of the population parameter, little p. I can calculate this variance where the little y is replaced by the little d. And the music y is replaced by the little p explicitly in terms of p. Right, so let's do that. Otherwise, it's exactly the same context. All the theory goes through. I just, I'm just subbing in a special case. So the mean and the variance depend on the same parameter, OK, in this dichotomous case. The mean is just this p parameter, and the variance can be written in terms of that parameter p. So let's do that. So the little p is the population the of the population. Mean of the population of ones and zeros. What? The population of ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. Either the hospital did or it didn't. Yeah, fewer than a thousand. So it's the expect mean of the oh. It's the mean of the sample. The mean of the sample mean also. That's always a theorem. That I also have e y bar is equal to mu y. That's a theorem. First theorem in the chapter. That have that. So if all, p hat is a random variable. Uh, the sample depended. Okay. If I sample size 25, the only values of p hat that I could come up with are zero. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0
I can calculate this in terms of the little p. All right, so I need to put the little y in terms of, I have the little y replaced by the little d. I'm replacing y by d, is what I'm doing. I'm subbing the d for the y and all these formulas. But the p hat is what you have to, <clears throat> in other words, if you, this, I'm telling you how to do it, okay? You define this d to make everything consistent, and then all the formulas are exactly as they work. And then you just say, oh, but the d bar equals p hat. So now I plug in that formula. If I, okay, so I'm the, 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 this is the equation that I'm going to use. So d is the random variable. And p hat is also a random variable. It's the same random variable. Oh. Why do we have to meet d and p hat then? It's just traditional to use p hat. Oh. The author doesn't even introduce the d. Okay. Okay, I'm telling you how to <laughs> connect. All right, the dots. All right, sigma d squared equals summation di squared total population. This is a population parameter. Divide by 393 minus the average of d. Right? What is mu sub d? Mu sub d is just the peak. It's just the peak. This is peak. It's not p hat. No, it's just oh, the average of these. Minus. Average of these. It's the average of the hat denotes the random variable. The non hat is a parameter. Okay? That is what Al pointed to. It's just, if it has a hat on it, it's an estimator or an estimate. Uh -huh. If it doesn't have a hat on it, it's a so parameter. So that's the expected value of p hat. Or it's right? not a capital letter. Capital letter is random variable. That's you, the expected value of p hat. That's correct. So how are you going to square? Got oh. square. Okay? <clears throat> so this is what is di is 1. Or zero. So I can actually explicitly calculate this. This is a total number of ones. Total number of ones is just n times p. And I'm dividing by n. Okay? Then I have minus p squared. Okay? So I have p minus p squared. That's the basic that's the basic variance of the indicator variable. That's the variance of the indicator variable. Variance of the indicator variable. Okay. So and that's not an estimate. That is the variance. That is the variance, population variance of an indicator variable. Uh -huh. So that's sigma of y? Sigma d squared. Variance of an indicator variable. Indicator variable is very special, and I have a very simple formula for its, its population variance. I've got it in terms of uh, p is the proportion of ones in the whole population. P is the proportion of ones in the whole population. Okay, so what I'm saying here is I'm just using these top lines here, and I'm going to sub in the special case of an indicator variable into these top lines, and then I'll be done. We're dealing with p hat. So I'm just saying substitute little d for a little y. I don't know if this is the best way to explain it, but it seems to be it's at least one way to explain it. And it's not, it, you're not doing anything new. You're doing a special case. Of a dichotomous variable. That's all. We're doing a special case. Variable, where I can define the kind of variable in terms of the other variable if I want, which is what is being done in this example. So that's the population variance of a dichotomous or indicator variable. It's P1 minus P. Period. Okay, it was a very simple calculation, was it not? <laughs> All right. Yeah. So bunch of ones and zeros adding up here. Okay. Now, uh, and we already know the mu sub d is, is p. Okay, so I won't rewrite that down. So therefore, what you have is that sigma sub d bar, sigma, I'm sorry, did I write it? I didn't put a square sign here. I should have put a square sign here. This should have been a square. That's the variance. Okay, that's my L1 name square. Everybody knows that. Okay. 
everybody with me there? Sigma squared sub d par equals sigma squared sub p hat. That's the variance of p hat. We have a couple of notations for it. The variance of p hat. Okay? We have two notations, either sigma squared sub something or the variance of the something. Okay? Equals. According to that, what you get is you divide by n, the little n, p, and you, multi and you have the 1 minus p, p1 minus p over little n, and you have the final population correction. That's it. By, by that formula, by this formula right here. It just follows from this. This implies this. Yeah. Okay? So it's immediate. So now I have the variance of p hat. So if I actually uh, so I actually can compute this if I know the population parameter, p, which they gave you in your exercise. It was given that p, little p is 0.654. So you can actually compute the actual variability of p hat, either through the standard deviation, the standard error, the standard error of p hat, so-called standard error of p hat, is simply the standard deviation of p hat, Square root of this, right? Yeah. It is the square root of p1 minus p. Yeah. And the square root of finite population correction. Okay. Okay. That's what they call the standard error. So you can actually compute that. Now, what if you don't know what P is? Then you can still try to get a confidence interval for P. So that's what we do. Okay. So this is here. I know what P is, and so I know what the mean is of P hat, and so on. This is just saying. So certain problems will tell you what P is. All right. And say, okay, so show that p hat is approximately a normal variable and actually show the density. Okay? That's when the little p is known, as in your example. So you can try to illustrate the exact density of p hat as it is approximately a continuous density. Okay? So, so that would hold even if we didn't know what p was? This is true, yeah. This is true. So, that's, how would you then get a confidence interval? You have the algebraic approach here. So, therefore, if I, I now rewrite this thing down as minus z less than or equal to p hat minus p over the sigma of p hat, which is the square root of p one minus p over n times the square root of one minus little n minus one over capital. Approximately two p of z minus one. So I have an approximate probability for that. Put probability statements. P hat is the random variable. P is a fixed number, 0.654. This is some other junk. Okay. What if you don't know what p is? That's the whole point of this statement. I can still make this probability statement even if I don't know what p is. Whatever p is, this statement is true. Yeah. P is some true value. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's just whatever. He is from those hospitals. Okay? No, I can't I don't know it because I didn't actually go out and do the work and figure out what all the values of the common variables are. Okay. But I can still make this probability statement. Now how would you get a confidence number for P? Say, well let's let's use a sample estimate to get a confidence number. Wait, so do the others. Yeah, this is the whole point. You don't know what P is now, let's say. So you, now you try to make a confidence number. Say, well, what is p, how, how close is p hat to my actual p? So I'm going to actually get the sample value of p hat. I'm going to go ahead and sample the 25 hospitals. I'm going to get 0.56, let's say. Okay. And um, is that, you know, within uh, 0.2 of p or 0.1 of p? How close is 
my range of possible p values. Like that's my confidence in basically the range of possible p values. I don't know what p is, but I'll probably get an idea of what p is by looking at the confidence interval, the center of p hat. So what you do is you rewrite this statement as you put the little p in the middle and the p hat's on the outside. And you take this, 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 this is what I'll just call this the standard error p hat, so I don't have to rewrite this down every time. Okay, sigma sub p hat. Okay? So what I have is that uh, I have rewriting the probability by manipulating this any double inequality on the inside. I have that, um, let's see, first I'll have p hat minus p less or equal to z times uh, sigma p hat, varying with the minus z times sigma p hat. That's equal to the same thing, okay? And now I want to put the p somehow on one side of the inequality in the p hat and the sigma of p hat on the other side. This is times. I don't want to have this is going to be confusing. What did you need? You need the close parentheses. This one. Okay. So I'll put the little p over there and put the z sigma of p hat over there. Okay. That's on one side of the issue. Okay? <laughs> that gives me p greater than p hat minus something. All right? mm -hmm. And on the other side, I'll put the p over here, and the z sigma hat, p hat over there, and I get p less than or equal to p hat plus something. Mm -hmm. So this is equal to the probability that p is less than or equal to p hat plus z sigma sub p hat, and greater than or equal to p hat minus z sigma sub p hat, okay, where z is a number like 2. I always think of Z as the number of two. <laughs> okay. I think you're going to do almost the identical problem in your homework. Only you're not only you're going to start with only one side of equality. You're going to do greater than minus. And you're going to leave this part off, mm -hmm. and you're going to say that's approximately P of Z. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you only have to deal with one inequality or the other one. Let's skip that. Okay. So which one do we do both or this one? This is a two-sided comedy. Yeah. For the homework, do we do both sides or just? Well, one I think side? you're doing this side and then you're doing the other side. Okay. Two different parts of the problem. Okay. Just leave off one of the inequalities. Just okay. one or the other. So this gives you P, the actual unknown population parameter, is sandwiched between this number and this number with a high probability. Okay? That is, in if you put now Z equals Z equals Z, let's just make it explicit Z.025, then you get uh, 2 phi of Z minus 1 equals 0.95, where C.025 uh, means that there's 2.5% of the area to the right of this number under the standard normal density. Z.025 in parentheses. So this is not a percentage point. Oh, it is a percentage point. It's a 97.5% percentage point, okay? So this is area equals 0.025. Yeah. And this is standard normal density. N01 density. Okay? So that's this statement now, if I put that particular Z in there, is that in 95% of the samples that I can get, what's the percent I can get right? In 95% of the samples, this interval contains P, P in the middle, the actual P in the middle. Okay. Uh, the random interval if I think now P has a random variable, 
point at z, the signals of p hat. And signals of p hat not as a random variable. I have signals of p hat in terms of population parameter. That's not a random variable. The p hat plus z, signals of p hat, okay, contains p in 95% of all samples, okay? Contains P with probability of 0.95. So there you can actually make a probability statement, okay? But the question? In 95% of all samples, boy, it's really squeezed down in here. I hope you can read that. Or maybe I'll just say it again. This, this, when I'm thinking of this p hat as a random variable, I can make the statement that this random interval then contains p in 95% of all samples. So we expect p to be in, in there. Okay, so that gives you a, a reasonable range for the p. All right, what it might be. And when, it's, when I put in a single sample, okay, when I put in a single sample, then this interval has no probability associated with it. Okay, because it's just two numbers. Okay. So then you can't make a public statement. When I just put the estimate and not the estimator in there, okay? So this estimator is a conceptual thing. It's a random variable. The estimate, if I actually go ahead and now physically put in the number 0.56 that I got, okay, then that's a confidence interval. All right? Yes? How do you get sigma of P hat? Okay, there's the formula right there. But what if we don't know P? Right, then you put in P hat in place of P. Then you call it S of P. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So then what you have is that S of P hat. Okay. So sigma squared. squared P hat and S squared P hat are two different things? Yes. Slightly different. The S oh, squared. S, squared of, S squared of P hat would be 1 over n minus 1 summation di squared minus P hat squared. Mm -hmm. Minus n p hat squared. That's the shortcut formula mm -hmm. for. So I'm, I'm mixing things instead of I, I'll put a new d hat, but that's the same as p hat. Okay. In, oh. So I'm going back to the dichotomous variable. Now, how many ones did you have? This is just p hat itself. N n p hat that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is one over n minus one. N p hat minus n p hat squared like that. So you don't get exactly p hat minus p hat squared for the example variance What's of the N dichotomous P? variable. You get n over n minus 1 p hat minus p hat times 1 minus p hat for the sample variance of the dichotomous variable. Sample variance of the dichotomous variable. And you can variable. use it. That's just the samples variance, right? Yeah, sample variance. That's and a, sigma p hat is the real variance. Right. Sigma p hat squared is the real variance. So this is the sample variance of a dichotomous variable. So now I'm just going to plug in um, this in place of that, OK? Roughly speaking, and um, well, plus fixing up the uh, the bias and so on. So what I'm getting is um, I put this in the notes, but I'm basically I'm getting S of p hat is going to be p hat one minus p hat over n minus one square root, and then. Uh, this final population correction is slightly different too. <laughs> okay, which is confusing. Okay, because see, S P hat squared is not unbiased. It's not unbiased for. Um, it is because this is not a linear function of P hat, right? So it doesn't necessarily have equal to P one minus P one. I think the expected value is not. Okay. The expected value of p hat 1 minus p hat is not equal to p 1 minus p. Like if p hat was 1 or 0, and the s squared would be like 0, it would be kind of like weird, wouldn't it? 
see how that, that, that could come out. Yeah. But I get the whole the point is that there's a slightly different finer population correction. This is a minor point. There's a slightly different finer population correction than in here. I just why didn't I just take this and replace it by the p1 minus p that I would I would get this finer population correction and not this one. Okay. The reason I'm getting this one is because the expected value of p hat one minus p hat is not equal to p1 minus p. Okay, this is a slightly different factor based on the finite population. This is PP. Okay, the book says that's unbiased estimate. If I square this, then I have an unbiased, then, then this is unbiased. But right now it's this biased. Is, this is, oh, this? Uh -huh. This, this is, uh, this is not unbiased in the finite case. It says it's unbiased estimate of variance of where? What pitch? Oh, that would be. Page 212. Okay, I'm going to fix this. Corollary B. They have a finite population correction, one minus little n over capital N in that. Hmm? Yeah, this correct. This is correct. If I square this, this is unbiased. Yeah? That's what I'm doing. Okay? Uh -huh. So this one I want to square is an unbiased estimate of sigma sub p hat squared. Mm -hmm. Alright? But this one here. Oh, this one's s squared. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I made a mistake here. S I should have been putting this is this is the wrong rotation here. Mm -hmm. This should have been uh, D. Okay. Okay. Because I was just doing the dichotomous variable here. This one is not unbiased for um, p. For the, to be, for the, for the, for the p but one minus. But doesn't the n minus one make it unbiased? <sighs> not in the finite population case. Go to um, um, theorem A previous page, with simple random sampling, E sigma hat squared is a bunch of junk, okay, sigma squared times a bunch of other stuff, and I get rid of one of the fact, I get rid of some of the stuff, so I replace that by S squared, so what you actually have is that the analog of theorem A says theorem A, page 211, I didn't want to get into this, but you're forcing me to, E sigma hat squared equals sigma squared, N minus 1 over N, times capital N over capital N minus 1, okay? Now what is S, S squared? S squared of a variable, let's put any variable you want here, D let's say, okay, just, just for instance, okay? D, for any variable, all right? What's E of S D squared is equal to um, N over N minus 1 sigma hat D squared because of the definition, sigma has to d squared, you divide by n, not n minus 1. Okay? This is s d squared divided by n minus 1. Sigma has to d squared is equal to 1 over n summation di squared minus n mu sub d squared, like that. Okay? Uh, so I'm just going to d bar. Should have been capital D. I should put capital D here because this is a finite sample. D bar squared. I'll put D bar squared here. Right. That's clearer. All right. I'm just I'm putting the D instead of the P. Right? So D is the total population, right? D capital D is a variable like a capital Y or a capital X. This is ones or zeros. Yeah. Be totally consistent. See, I'm having to flip a little bit because it's, I'm having follow, trouble following my program as well. <laughs> because the program is a little confusing. But let's try to follow the dang thing, okay? Here, I always put the little letter for the subscript in this chapter, okay? For the random variable D. So normally we put a capital D there, but in this chapter we're always putting the subscript as a little letter. Okay? Okay. <laughs> That's rule number one. Rule number two, if it's a sample, you put the capital D. Okay? Uh, if it's the if it's the whole population, you put the little D. 
All right. Rule number three. <laughs> D bar equals B hat. <laughs> oh, that's God. what I introduced today. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what I'm doing is I'm calculating this. This is a sample variance. Mm -hmm. Okay, a real sample variance. I talked about. I calculated all possible sample variances on last lecture. Remember, for that one particular but, case we had. But isn't the other one? And this one is also sample variance. It's just a different version thereof. Okay, where I divide by n instead of little n minus one. But aren't you supposed to divide by n minus one because the okay. degrees are free? Okay, let's talk whatever. about it. The theorem A, page 211, if it's the independent case, then what you get is that E of S D squared is equal to, let's calculate the expectation. I have to multiply this by n over n minus 1. I just exactly cancel that. Therefore, that's equal to sigma squared times capital N over capital N minus 1. All right? Which shows that in the finite population case, even when I divide by the little n minus 1, there's still a bias for sigma squared. Because it's not the big n. Because of the big n. If big n is infinity, that gives you sampling with replacement, essentially. Mm -hmm. All right. How is that sampling with? If I have an infinite population, uh -huh. oh, okay. it doesn't matter if I take a few out. Okay. So the independent case corresponds to capital N equals infinity. Mm -hmm. So that's with the finite replacement. case. This now the finite case. You don't have so S of d squared is not unbiased for six d squared. There. Is the situation okay? But you okay. You can because it's a small you can area. fix it by both by the capital N minus one over capital N, and that's what's being done here. But you, what if you don't know? That's what's actually being done because you have a capital N of minus a little n, which always comes when you fix this fraction. This fraction is a capital N minus a little n on top, but a capital N minus one on the bottom. Here now I have a capital N minus a little n on the top, but a capital N on the bottom because I fixed it by multiplying by the reciprocal of this capital N minus one over capital N. Okay? So that's why you have this fraction rather than the other little one. Okay? Which doesn't make a whole lot of excuse me, it doesn't make a whole big a difference, okay? Alright? It doesn't make that much of a difference. The final population correction. Alright, sorry. This is alright. So there's all these nasty little formulas running around that you'll be very hard pressed to memorize. Who can have a TT on the final? Maybe we'll have a published sheet sheet. How about you make the sheet sheet? Yeah, I'll just make the sheet sheet. I'll just take a couple of tables out of the book and just copy them. Okay? So, that's, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get an approximate 95% confidence interval by replacing the sigma sub p hat by the s sub p hat right here. I had my sigma sub p hat, which I didn't write down, I just wrote sigma sub p hat squared. Here I wrote sigma sub p hat here. I can to replace that one by this one in that formula for the grant in that formula of the confidence and all. So my confidence interval. Confidence interval is approximately 95% confidence interval. The question is, how do you know what your population is? Indeed. Your n, big n. Usually you know, the, game, the rule of the game is you know what your capital N is. The rule of the game is you know what your capital N is, you actually know how many institutions you're, you're studying in your population. <coughs> the rule of the game is you know capital N, and you may even know some auxiliary variables, like the number of beds. In the next problem, we're going to say we know the actual Auxiliary variable xi, the number of beds in each hospital, that's been written down in stone for decades. Okay? So you may even know exactly an auxiliary variable. Alright? You may know all 393 values of the number of beds. Okay? And that actually occurs in accounting problems. Apparently, you have the book value. That's easy to look up. That's the that's known for every vehicle, let's say, in some large warehouse of vehicles or whatever population of vehicles. Blue book values, easy to look up. 
then you have the assessed value of the vehicle where you start looking under the hood and, and the history of the car and kicking the tires and all that business, okay? That's a whole big job, right, for somebody expert to figure out what this car is actually worth, all right? So then you want to audit and basically try to figure out how much the whole parking lot is worth, okay? You're not gonna go look under the hood of every car. You're gonna take around a sample of those vehicles and actually analyze. And then based on the blue book, try to figure out, uh, to use a blue book, assuming that the blue book is highly correlated with the actual values, that you can get a better estimate than just taking the sample average. In other words, by using one variable that is um, easy to look up, okay, and highly correlated with the variable you're interested in, you can get a better estimate just by taking the sample average of the audited values of those 25 cars. <laughs> okay? So this, that's going to be a ratio estimator. <clears throat> that's what we're getting to. We're trying to get to. We're trying to get to today, and we're not going to get to today completely. But I can start talking about the ratio. Well, we'll just start to get into that. That's one of your uh, homework problems for, for next week. I'm referring to the auditing, the auditing context. Yeah, that's the key, a key problem. Yes, in auditing problem number 41. That'll be due after the break then. Okay. Let's not do this with. So that's a kind of a nice, that's the nice thing that's in this chapter is that ratio of estimator. Where all, a lot of things from the book are going to be put together into that one concept. <clears throat> okay. So we have a section limit there and we have an approximate 95% confidence interval for P, which would be P hat minus 1.96 times the square root of P hat, 1 minus P hat. N minus 1 there, and then you put the, the N without the N minus 1 there, okay? Your uh, plus, plus or minus here. You don't have to write it down again, okay? That's the this is approximate 95% confidence interval for P. So, of course, you can do one for... for and that's unbiased? This well, this is this is the square root of an unbiased estimator okay. for for the uh, but it's, see this is a square root of unbiased estimator of variance. What's 1.96? That's 0.025. Oh. Okay. You remember that one, don't you? That's for 90, two sided 95% confidence. Do you remember that? Okay. I don't remember. Go back to math for one. <laughs> I had to go. We all remember 1.96. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I had to look at every single one. Oh, okay. But I, I, if you take, um, if your random sample is, say, for example, one, and like you get a one or a zero for okay, let's go ahead. To yeah. to that. Okay. If you take a random sample size of one, then of course this you, you can't get anything here. Okay. So that doesn't do nonsense. You need, need at least two to get some idea of oh, variation. <laughs> Okay. There's no variation if you only take one thing, one number. Okay. No sample variation. So I need some kind of number. If you got two zeros, yeah, then I'd still get P hat equal to zero, and I'd get an aspect of zero here, that'd be pretty classic. Because um, it's like the extreme cases. I think your confidence interval would get really small. Like, 
precise and whatnot. I think we're really low or high in okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's an approximate confidence interval. So the, the central limit theory doesn't apply to those small bands. Yeah. So you really do need the end to be well, bigger. My, I gotta... You need the end to be bigger to get P hat away from the endpoints, okay, with high probability. P hat can be at the endpoints with some considerable probability of NPT. Just not a good confidence interval at all. Yeah, small band, a very small band. Yes. I have a question. Like our problem on number seven. Now I'm really, really confused about that one because it says that you take a simple, uh, simple random sample of a of a family or whatever under poverty. It says give you like. Okay, let's have another example. Which which one? Seven point. Seven. Just seven. Number seven. That's, because I don't know if the it says proportion of okay. 0.15 is that p or p hat? It's p. Well, wait a second. Suppose that a super random sample is used to estimate the proportion of families in a certain area that are living below the poverty level. Okay, if this proportion is roughly 0.15, so they're saying if p is 0.15. Yeah. Oh, but I did it wrong. I thought that was p hat because. Well, oh, the, would you know what P is if you only have a sample? I'm just saying the range. Okay. Oh. Okay. Then going back, in the first part of these problems, they're only going to consider the standard error, not the estimated standard error. So they're going to basically say, okay, what is this if you know what, what does this conference table look like if you know roughly that P hat is 0.15? Or P or P hat is about, about the same. Well, P okay. is 0.15. My I answer put, basically, I put the 0.15 in there. Uh -huh. Okay. By changing this a little bit, I put the n here and put the n minus one back over here. Switch the n minus ones, okay? I put a capital n minus one there. Then this is now an also an approximate ninety-five percent confidence interval. This is not an unbiased estimate. This is just the variance that we had, okay? So you have two confidence intervals, depending on whether you know what p is or not. Of course, if you know what p is, there's no point. All right? If you get confidence interval. All right, but this is roughly what P is, okay? So this doesn't make any sense at all. But you can still talk about the sampling distribution of P hat, okay, if you know what P is. So this, this is really, so what you're saying is that P hat or P is roughly, this is, they're not saying whether P hat or P is roughly. We don't know what P is. Yeah, but we We're just say it's in the range of 0.5, 0.15. It's not 0.5, it's 0.15. It's kind of shifting so from one end P, of the spectrum. Right? Yeah, P or P hat. You gotta use basically use it in this context. But let's see, what does this say? What sample size is necessary to make the standard error of the estimate? So you're gonna plug in this formula. Okay. So the question is, are you gonna use this one with the n minus one and this P? This is the standard error of the estimate. They mean in this problem to use this one. Okay. They well, mean in this n? problem to use this. Without well, see I did it so it's P hat with n minus one. Is that wrong or right? Because you, could, you could do this one with the n minus one and the n yeah. and this one. Yeah, okay. I did it like that. You could get almost exactly the same answer. And it was one off, off by one. Right, so that's why, because the author did it this way. Yeah. Because off by with that one right there. Okay, the author Does did it matter? this No. You won't take well, the sample off size is going to be 300. Is it 301 or 302? Nobody's going to care. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's like one sample off. It was 320. The answer is 390. That's not totally fair, but thank you for your attention on that problem. And we'll have to quit now um, today. So, yeah, I think in these problems, you can just work in all these problems to do next Tuesday. Okay. You can just work with this as the uh, standard error. P hat. You don't, you don't get into the n minus, the little n, the little s. Into the sigmas that we have in this section of problems. If you want to all get the same answers. Okay. Okay. All right. Have a good uh, weekend. I'll see you on the next Tuesday. Two regressors, and I put the three way scatter plot x1, x2, y, then I get, I get some points in space. 
So you're supposed to think of this as a cloud of points in three space. And then your regression modeling is to try to fit a plane to this cloud. Okay? So this is y hat equals beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat x1 plus beta 2 hat x2. That's your, that's a plane. But then you have your x1 and x2 down here in the x axis. So this is just x1 and x2. This is your uh, x1, x2 plot. Okay, if I project all those points onto the x1, x2 plane, then that, that's your regressor space, your x space. Okay? x space is x1, x2 space. We're going to be kind of colloquial about that. We're not going to make up really great terminology, okay? In this text, anyway. Alright? So, now, What's the, what does extrapolating mean? Does it mean extrapolating, mean going outside the box that contains all of these points in X, in X space? Or does it mean going outside the smallest convex set that contains all of them? Or what? So statisticians had to grapple with that. Now, instead of an interval, you've got something else. So one, so then he's, he talks a little bit about uh, talking about the smallest convex set that contains all the points, the regressor variable hull. Reminds me of a math joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So. Does that make sense? You take all those and that would be the region of, and if you, if you take a point inside this, that will be called an interpolation point. So you can also talk about um, the smallest ellipse, or you can not talk about the smallest ellipse, but then you can talk about other things. And then what he's going to refer to is something in the text as uh, a certain ellipse that will contain the regressor variable, variable hull. So sort of this kind of a natural thing to do is to sort of associate some kind of ellipse with this, with this thing. Okay. Ellipses are common in statistics because of the joint normal distribution. <clears throat> So I'm not going to say exactly what that, uh, how that ellipse would be associated with this regressor, regressor variable hold. That's a non-trivial business. But we can talk about extrapolation versus interpolation. So let's say, what would yeah. be an extrapolation point? Yeah. Can't we just eliminate this with a good design of experiment? I mean, we are picking x1 and x2. Sometimes, right? yeah. Sometimes. But many times not. People will come to you with their data and say, help! Okay. <laughs> Analyze this for me, would you? Actually, that's the easiest part about it in some ways. The design is the, kind of the hard part sometimes. But yeah, you're limited in certain cases. Uh, take, take this delivery time data or what have you. They didn't uh, design. Well, you're going to march 1,000 feet and take 25 cases to the, to the place. It depends on what the situation was at, at the store that they had to stock this thing. So maybe that, those are fixed, and those stores are always the same, so it makes sense to fix the x1 and the x2. But what's the actual model in that universe of this umpteen number of sites where they have to stock the, the stuff? And if they build a new site, what could you expect for the delivery time? Now, would it be an extrapolation site, or would it be an interpolation site? See what I'm saying? No. You've got a new Home Depot, and you're going to have to take 60 cases of pop in there. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think that was an extrapolation case, because I think 30 cases was the most in the delivery time data. All right. Is this answering your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's move on. 
So we're being a little bit, so, so um, we say that a new regressor vector, x0, 1, x0, 2, remember i equals 0 means there's a new one, all right? Instead of n plus 1, we'll call it i equal to 0, all right? x0, 3 up to x0, k. So let's go to k regressors. Um, we say that if this lies outside the regressor variable hull, or which is the smallest set we might consider to be the don't, the x space, okay? That's the smallest thing we would consider to be the x spaces. I mean, you might make it even smaller. You might just say the x space is just these points themselves, okay? But well, that's not reasonable, okay? It's not very robust, okay? So if this lies outside RVH, then this uh, vector of regressor, vector of regressors, vector in x space is an extrapolation point. Okay. Okay. And extrapolation is required to estimate the mean response. All right. Now, now here's the fact. Another fact which we're not going to be able to develop, but you may be able to believe, okay, that if I take the vector 1, x1 up to xk, now I'm not putting any second index on the x's, so this is just independent variables now, corresponding to the x1 and x2 axes here, okay? That if I take this vector and I'm throwing in the 1, right, because I want a, a uh, P by, excuse me, a 1 by P vector. And if I take this times x prime x inverse, and then the column 1, x1 down to xk, and I call, and I consider the equal, inequality of this less equal to h max, where h max <coughs> is equal to the maximum of the diagonal elements of the H matrix, where H I J is equal to capital H equal X X prime X inverse X prime. That matrix. Okay. Look, this is just one row out of the X matrix. Okay. All right. This is like one row out of the X matrix. This is like one column out of the x prime matrix, 1, x1 down to xk. So if I actually put an i in here, all right, then this would equal hii. Notice this, that hii is equal to 1, xi1, xi2, up to xik, and then x prime x inverse times 1, xi1 down to xik. That's how we've defined hii. It's a diagonal element, because this is the diagonal, the ii diagonal element of this projection matrix, h. Is everybody kind of following that? And then, so if this is true, it's an interpolation? Um, if this is true, then that's the interpolation region, yeah. Okay, let's see, consider this the set of x1 through xk. I have to put the 1 there, okay, but I'm only considering the set of x1 through xk in rk, all right, in regressor space, okay, x space, such that, okay, then this defines, this inequality defines an ellipse that contains the regressor variable hull. This relation, what do we call this star? I'll just call it star. Then this relation star uh, defines an ellipse 
ellipsoid, I guess I should call it in general, in RK that contains the regressive variable hull. So it's some kind of ellipse like that, okay? Containing it. Now, should it be tangent somewhere? I imagine it does. Okay, where? But that, there's, the, there's kind of like uh, the, the, the biggest HII will correspond there, right? We're, so I guess I've made this the biggest one or something like that, okay? Where the HII is max at this point, okay? Making sense? Kind of? It's believable, though it's not obvious that this should be maybe defined an ellipse. Without the one, you can easily see it. And with the one, you have to convince yourself. Okay? Because this is a positive definite matrix. Okay? A little bit of linear <coughs> You have to do a little bit more work. Okay. So that's going to be our basic, we're going to expand the regressive variable hole to this ellipsoid. We call that our interpolation region, just because it's a lot easier to deal with. Okay? And so if I want to check any um, regressive values, x0, 1 through x0, k, check to see whether there's an extrapolation point or not, I just um, calculate this inner product with x1 through xk replaced by x0 through x0 x0, 1 through x0, k, okay, and put the ones in there, and so on. So this is done. Okay, let's look at this in the example. Example 313, this has been done. Now, how do you calculate the HIIs, and how do you calculate H max? Just find H and then find the max solution. Yeah, you find H, and I think I did it with the Maple uh, program in the notes 3. I actually found uh, the H matrix, and then it was easy. Once you find a matrix in Maple, you can easily call the diagonal elements, because you can call any elements. Now in Excel, I can calculate the H matrix, but how will I get the diagonal elements out? There might be a command in Excel, I was going to check it yesterday, you know, like try M diag or something like that, just try some formula. <laughs> okay, but without looking at the documentation, I'm not sure if it can be done that easily, because it's going to be a diagonal array, not a, not a column array or a row array, and Excel doesn't do too well with diagonals probably, <laughs> unless, it's, unless it's programmed. You can type it. You can pull the, the diagonal off. It's only 25 numbers. Okay. That's not so bad, but it's kind of crude. It'd be easier to just build your own. You can eyeball it in most yeah. cases, because in, in, most, in most cases of interest, you could probably eyeball it and just say, I don't look down the diagonal, but uh, you'd have to do something. So that could, that's a minor annoyance. Perhaps. We haven't checked whether Excel can do it or not. All right? So, um, in the case of uh, the delivery time data, then you have uh, Hmax, it turns out to be equal to 0.49829, all right? So you're getting an H matrix, and it looks like something, and the biggest number on the diagonal somewhere. And I'm not sure exactly which one, which diagonal element was. I'd have to look back at notes three to check that. Here it is. I believe in the delivery time data, there were 25 data points and the diagonal matrix, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the ninth point. I guess that was the 30 cases and uh, the 30 cases point. <laughs> okay, that was 0.4982. This was uh, observation number nine. So this was the nine nine element, and this was a 25 by 25 matrix. Okay, it was 0.4982. And I believe in the delivery time data, which is example 3.1, actually it was back in chapter 2. Uh, but 3.1 gives you both cases and distance. <clears throat> Observation 9 was 30 cases and 1,460 feet. That was pretty far out in the, uh, re in the regressor space. 
Okay, it was like an isolated point way far away from all the other points. It was like a point way out here or something like that. I think there was a 29 cases as well. Or was there? Yeah, there was a 26 cases at 810 feet. But this was twice the distance. So it was kind of an isolated point. Uh, like here, you have two, two. And I guess, let's see, with the, 20, the 22nd observation had 26 cases at 810 feet. And the HII corresponding to that was 0.39. So he had two HII values. This is the 22nd observation. And all the other ones were pretty small. HII has to be less than or equal to 1. Because, it, well, um, let's see. Well, because I minus H is, is still in a positive matrix, I guess. The identity minus H is still a non-negative matrix, so non negative definite. You can't have anything negative on the diagonal. That's one way to think about it. <laughs> okay. So I minus H is a non-negative definite matrix. <laughs> and if you had a, uh, a negative number on the diagonal, then it wouldn't be a non-negative matrix anymore. Okay, so HII is less than or equal to 1. <coughs> okay. So there's what it was, and that was the delivery time data. And so now let's put in something. I guess they asked us to say, let's take eight cases and go 275 feet, all right, to deliver. Is that an extrapolation point? And then he goes ahead and calculates. And then let's see, how about if I had to do something else, and so on and so forth. So he takes, um, no, he takes eight cases and goes 1,200 feet. All right, so there's a long gang way to go, all right? So it's not that big of a Home Depot, but it's a long way to walk. Okay? Somehow. <laughs> Everyone buys Coke, he's Pepsi. Oh, well, <laughs> that could be a problem. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and calculate what I'm erasing here. I'm going to go ahead and calculate this for the case where I have so if I take x1 equals to 8 and x2 is equal to 1,200 feet, this is 8 cases, at 1,200 feet, then um, I'll go ahead and calculate the, this product, this h00, I'll call it h00, equal 1, 8, 1,200. I have to calculate the x prime x matrix, invert it. We actually did that with Excel almost. So we had the columns messed up, but you did that, right, Shane? Yeah. Okay, does everybody know how to do inverses and all that M inverse and use the shift control enter key? Have you tried it yet? I have one quick question about that. Is there any way that you can, does the data have to be like right next to each other in the columns for, for your X's or is there any way you can take a piece of like this column over here and then this column over here to make your, no, you have to like just generate get the order them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's just make sure we can do this. Let's go ahead and make this calculation on the board. Okay, let's see for the, I don't have the delivery time data, but uh, oh, no, what should I do it for? I guess I can't. I don't have the delivery time data. Well, we all do. You do? It's in the book. Oh, I know, but I have to get the X matrix and it'll take a, a night and a day. Okay. Where's that website you need to do it? Ah, the website. Okay. I'm with you. Let's do it. Is this a homework assignment that we've already sent? If it's in there. Let's just go ahead. Let's go ahead through the. She's got the website. She's got the secret. Let's do it. Okay. FTP. Uh, yeah. I'm just gonna. It's, it's, it's linked to my website. Unfortunately, I had closed it, so I'm gonna have to go back to it. www.uccs. You really want to see this? Okay. Uh, slash Gmorrow. Okay. All right. Let's go. See if we can get there. Yeah, that was pretty quick. I guess it's not too bad. 483583 and go to the website. Please. Is it link working? How come it doesn't work? Can't you just, oh, you got to cut and paste it?
Oh, it's doing it it's very slowly. Okay. This open up the. Uh, looks like yeah. I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and do this. Open. Progress. Open. Okay. Do I really have to do this? Okay, let's see if it has delivery time data. Oh, it might not have it. No, we just have to find the right problem. Uh, it might have it under a different name. Where did it? Yeah, we didn't have, there is no exercise because it's, a, it's an example in the book. Soft drink. Ah, that's got to be it. Yes, indeed. Okay. There it is. Okay? So. I just do I need to save this as a save as on the desktop yeah. or something like that. Okay, now is this the is the other browser still open so I have to close it or something? Well, just minimize it. Minimize it? But it won't let me open the one on the desktop. I'll have to close it. Yeah. Let's just close this whole thing. The browser's working all right. So what's the one I want? Data software. Data software. i got to close this one, right? That's the... Uh, no. Ah, what happened? It all died. Just close it. Don't click on it. It'll open. Okay. All right, there we go. So here's the X matrix. Let's just, this is the way that Shane taught us how to do it. You name it. You go here to the name box and you call it capital X, let's say. You have to hit the enter button in order to get it answers. That's then. It, then the name goes in the center of the name box. You can't see the name box, um, can you? You might want to include a row of ones. I forgot. Okay, yeah. let's do it again. So um, I need to put that before. Put it first, yeah. So here's the question that Travis was having: Where do you put things? You just cut and paste so that you get it where you want it. I forgot. So I'm going to have to put one in here. Enter that and then pull down the ones. Can you no, you can you read this? Put two ones. ones. Okay, never mind. It doesn't work that way. Normally it counts that way. Okay. It doesn't. Two, three doesn't. So now let's rename this. I don't know. Can I can I rewrite over a name? You have to clear it. It's, yeah. so you just call it something else. Call it like XT or something. <laughs> okay. Let's just call it little X. Okay. No, because uh, yeah, Excel it's doesn't it's distinguish between the two. It doesn't. Oh, that little devil. Okay. So you have to. Let's call it uh, W then. Highlight it again. As soon as you clicked X, it went to what it was. I know. I hate. It. Well, I could clear X, right? But let's not. Let's Just call it W or something. All right, W. All right. That's my W. Oh, I actually don't need it because I just need uh, W prime W now, right? Yep. Okay, so I'll call it. I can call it whatever I want up here. All right. So I'll call it X prime X. So then I just I need an array formula, right? It's going to be a three by three. So it's equal to M mult. And then what we said was, you can actually just put the arrays in. So if, even if I hadn't named it, I could do that, right? Right. All right, but since I did name it, we'll put it, what, the transpose of W? Yeah. And there is no M transpose. That's just transpose. But make sure you have it spelled right. And then W, comma, W. Then there is where you need the shift control enter, right? Okay, so there's x prime x. Now I want the inverse of that. So now I need to put another three by three. It's a three. It's an array formula again. So first I have to highlight where it's going to go, and it has to be at least enough. And then go up here to the formula bar, and then put equal. Now it is an m inverse. M i n v e r s e of. I could name x prime x, but it's easier just to highlight it. Okay? Close the parenthesis, the again, shift, control, enter. It's a three key sequence. Shift, control, enter in order to get it. Okay? And so there's my inverse. Now I need to calculate this business where I'm going to put in the, the uh, row. Let's see, let's put it, um, it was 1, 8, 1200, right? Okay. I've already got H max, so I'm not going to calculate the H matrix now. All right? And let's see, I could reference this if you want. But let's not. 
bother. Let's just put in, uh, let's just do it this way, okay? So let's just take now, I need to highlight a space now before I'm going to get this scalar, all right? So I need to calculate that inner product, that scalar, and see if it's less than or equal to h max or not. All right, so that is equals m mult. It's a three-way product, so I'm going to need two m mults. m mult, right? Because m mults takes two arguments. It takes. Uh, I would use some, the, the other one that you used after you get two array or two vectors because. Take this one, okay? That's the vector, and then times the x prime inverse x prime x, okay? Oh really? Yeah. And then take comma transpose of this little dude. It's not gonna like that? I don't think so. Shift control enter. Oh right. <laughs> sure. All right. One minute to go. So point eight six seven three six. That is indeed bigger than the H max. Therefore, you're at an extrapolation point. Okay. And so they showed a little picture. They they took four examples. Let's see if you have one minute to to show a close up of the picture. I don't know. You have thirty seconds now. Page one hundred and twelve, where they show a picture of. They take four different uh, scenarios. And the one we worked out was um, the, one at the, top. the X right here, the one at the top. And then they had in, in some interpolation values and some extrapolation values included. Okay, so I think we'll call that for the first hour. And we'll go on to another topic next hour. Any comments? Okay, very good.